we had um, we had already guess yesterday already had an, uh, an, an a first image from the uh, wise um, biological inspired engineering, not biomimicry, biological inspired engineering, which I very much understand as uh, as uh, different different rules. And uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have as keynote speaker Donald Inglet to um, give his lecture. Thank you. So thanks very much for the invitation. And I guess as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Um, I have, as you heard, I'm the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. And what I'm going to try to do is describe how we bridge the art science interface and how biology can inform architecture. But you're also going to see how architecture can inform biology. Now, I, I, off, I like to say that our dynamic logo is indicative of the fact that we're in the process of self-assembly, uh, but we've gone in 24 months from zero to 230 full-time staff on site in 60,000 square foot of space. So we've kind of gone beyond the self-assembly stage. So I'm gonna, two, two to three minutes on the Wies Institute. It's Wies because it's Swiss name, uh, hans jurg Wies. Essentially, I was asked to, to help envision across all of Harvard and its affiliated institutions the future of bioengineering. Bioengineering in the past is essentially taking engineering principles and trying to solve medical problems. It's been incredible. You have the hip implant and stents and pacemakers and, and drug rele release systems. But we feel the future is one that's going to be different because all the boundaries between the disciplines in sciences, and I, I mean biology, physics, chemistry, computer science, material science, they're all breaking down. Physicists are publishing in biology. I've published in the same journals that Einstein published the theory of relativity. It, it is completely boundaryless. And as a result, we're really beginning to understand how nature builds from the bottom up. We can manipulate at the, at, at the atomic scale, at the molecular, cellular, one atom at a time, we could do it all. So as a result of this convergence, the boundaries between living and non-living systems are beginning to break down. And so we feel that the future is one where rather than engineering being applied to biology, we feel that we're going to leverage biological design principles to develop new engineering solutions. Now, early on, we got a potential donor involved, Hans-Jörg Wies. Uh, he's individually worth about six to eight billion dollars. Um, and essentially, he was excited about this, but we sold him on another part of this, which is that medicine and biology have scaled together for 300 years. But fields like architecture, manufacturing, aerospace have not been touched. And so this institute vision was to go broad and to do medical and non-medical. And we were launched, and so the idea was have an institute that would focus on transforming healthcare industry and the environment by emulating the way nature builds. Two goals, to discover nature's design principles, and then the key part, to engineer biologically inspired materials and devices to revolutionize healthcare and enhance sustainability. And I'm going to talk about the latter today. We were founded in January 2009 with the single largest gift in Harvard's history of $125 million. That's purely for operating funds. There's a similar amount that's given by the university for the space and, and administration. We focus on high-risk research and technology development. We are specifically supposed to span academic, academia and industry. As I said, we've grown from zero to 230 full-time staff on site. We don't fund it like academia does by by faculty member, we fund what we call collaboratories where I have people that are across different parts of the floor depending on projects they work on. We've recruited over 25 um, people, staff from industry with 10 to 20 years of experience in product development and team management who get integrated so that we have product development teams. We are not a research institute, we're a technology, innovation, and translation institute. And we're structured to harness the whole Boston-Cambridge region because we really feel that if you're going to do medicine and building material science, robotics, IT, it's very hard to compete. And so we have a, an alliance among many different institutions that allow their faculty to be on site. So we could have one partnership with industry, for example, one agreement, not many little agreements. And interesting for those of you in academia, our measures of success are usual, you know, publish and international recognition, recruitment, but it's the intellectual property portfolio we create, the corporate alliances, licensing agreements, and new startups that we spin out, and we, and we have to have in five years products in the pipeline. 
And the last slide, just to show, I think what's important here is that we bring together some of the most incredible and entrepreneurial scientists, engineers, and clinicians. We have people from industry that I've mentioned that are also our institutional memory when students come and go. We've got executive management who've only had startup experience. But then we very early in the process, and why I'm here to a big reason is that we bring in industrial and clinical collaborators and we want to have end users who teach us what the problem is, what, where the value lies, where the stupid things like, you know, having it cheap and dumb for, you know, fabrication or storage or logistics that they could tell us early on. So scientists can go design things in many different ways. It's much better to know early on that it's in a way that will have value at the end. And so Chuck Horberman, as you heard, has been involved as a visiting scholar, which is one way we bring people who are from the outside real world into the academic community. Now we've organized this not by giving out grants like academics usually do, but we funded what we call enabling technology platforms. These are really groups of people that jointly develop technolo new technological capabilities that can enable a whole new wave of bio-inspired materials and devices. We have six, four are medical, and then two are things I think will interest you. Uh, bio-inspired robotics, robo robots that move and adapt like living organisms, as well as collective swarms of robots mm -hmm. that could be programmed to do what you want. And adaptive architecture, responsive building materials, which is why I'm here. But before I go into this, I want to talk a little about the uncovering design principle side and sort of tell a personal story where we've learned that architecture is a fundamental biological design principle. So my own work for 35 years has been trying to understand how living cells and tissues are constructed. Living cells, I think, are the ultimate intelligent building materials. They're mechanically strong, resilient. They're multifunctional, chemical, mechanical, electrical, optical information. It's all the same material. They grow, they move, they self-heal, they learn, adapt, self-organize. And all of this emerges through hierarchical self-assembly without a blueprint from nanoscale components. Now, most people think of cells as sort of, I always say, a water balloon filled with molasses or a balloon filled with goop. Uh, that's how it was when I got into the field in the early 70s. Uh, flexible membrane, goopy cytosol, nucleus floating at the center. Many engineers and biologists to this day think of it this way. And I came into this in the mid-70s, believe it or not, 35 years ago, and uh, people thought of cells like water balloons. I suggested a different idea is that cells are built more like tents. If you want to stabilize a tent, you have a flexible membrane, you put up a strut, and you put in tent pegs, and then you winch it in, and you put it under tension, you pre-stress it, and you have a stable structure that holds its shape. And this was based on the fact that in the mid-70s when I, when I got into this, people had just described that all cells have an internal molecular framework made of molecular scale, nanometer scale molecular struts, ropes, and cables called the cell skeleton or cytoskeleton that goes from the nucleus to the surface if you unpeel the membrane. Now, biologists have worked on this for 35 years, but they tend to think of it like jello, like a gel. They always talk about the gel properties. I suggested a different idea, and that cells use a very particular form of architecture that you're all familiar with, because you just heard about it. It's called tensegrity. Uh, it's first coined by Buckminster Fuller from tensional integrity. It, it uses continuous tension rather than continuous compression. Snelson was the first to build these strut and cable structures, but Fuller described it, the geodesic dome is sort of the ultimate example of it, because even though it's made of all struts, only some of them are bearing compression and others bearing tension at any moment. This, by the way, is a geodesic dome in a human cell in culture, and that is, called, that is the actomyosin cytoskeleton, the actomyosin of the molecular filaments that create tension in muscles, and they actually, the first paper that visualized these described these as actin geodomes. The width of each one of those is about, you know, 10 nanometers, that's a billionth of a meter in width. Now, I started to, I proposed that cells use this because um, so I started using this toy model, actually this light's good to show it, and you probably have seen this. This is a tensegrity but with flexible elastic elements. If you didn't have the elastic element, uh, if you didn't have the sticks which don't touch, this would be like a spider web here. If I pushed it, it'd have no shape stability, but because the sticks tense the strings and the strings compress the sticks, it self-stabilizes. Because it's symmetrical, it's round, but if I were to anchor it on this foundation, at discrete points, it would flatten, and if I were to clip the anchors, it would bounce up in the air. Ball, please, thank you. Very nice, and um, I should say that, and this is true, I was uh, 
18, 19 years old, I was an undergrad at Yale taking a sculpture course in three-dimensional design where my professor had one of these and he was bouncing it. And it was the same week I learned how to culture cells where I saw, and you can turn the lights out, when you clip the anchors of cells, they do the exact same thing. They round up just like that. And it was the same year that they found that they have a skeleton. And I said, oh, cells must be built this way. And I remember telling, and I was doing work in a cancer research lab where I did this. And I remember the postdoc gave a drug and it, cells rounded up. And I said, oh, the tensegrity must have changed. And he said, tensegrity, what's that? I said, well, I'm taking a sculpture course, Buckminster Fuller, Kenneth Snell. He said, never say that again. And, <laughs> and as someone said yesterday, that was the beginning of the rest of my life. So at any rate.